school a couple of hours every night and they mm. learn their songs at home as well as doing school work and I really think they're terrific kids. Mm. You'd be fairly sympathetic there oh, too because you used to have to go through your paces, didn't you? We used to work um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, had Thursday afternoon off. Friday was private lesson all day Saturday for six hours and when you were doing competitions you'd work a private lesson on a Sunday right. to get through your competition. So you know what it's all about, all right? Yep. Listen, you and I are sort of just roughly, very roughly, the same vintage. So you would remember. <laughs> you, <laughs> you mean you make your own wine? Is that what you mean? <laughs> <laughs> but listen, you, you would have faced life with Porsche. Oh, as a Porsche. Kid, wouldn't you? Remember old Porsche? Don't you drive those? <laughs> <laughs> no, life with Porsche, I remember. Yes. Yeah, right. You, Why is she here? Uh, not Porsche, but actually Margot Lee. I do remember who Margot Lee. Faced yes. life with Porsche for yes. many years. Well, Margot Lee is with us tonight. Would you give her a big welcome to the show? <laughs> Margot, it's a dreadful way to introduce an actress, isn't it? Well, um... You faced life with Portia. Well, I hate to, to, um, to correct you. Oh, no. I can't you didn't take, face life with Portia. I can't take away the credit from Lyndall Barber. You see, uh, it was Lyndall Barber who faced Portia uh, for all those years. I, I mean, I must say I was in it. Yeah. Uh, did quite a few episodes, but that was Lyndall Barber's show. Yeah, she she played Porsche. Actually, I thought it was Dinah Shearing who played uh, Porsche. No, Maybe we all get over. muddled. You see, we all get muddled up with Dinah Shearing and there's Lyndall Barber. And it's the age, you see. And there was <laughs> Neva Carglin and there were, you know, there yeah. were the big sort of... Um, so there were, in fact, half a dozen Porsches, uh, probably, were there? Uh, no, no, uh, no. Lyndall always played uh, Porsche. Mm. I played things like um, The Right to Happiness, and I still get fan mail from, from Canada uh, really? <laughs> uh, with the right, uh, about the right to happiness. I have a man who, who phones me even and writes oh, me really? letters. And those old serials are still kicking around the world. Yes, uh, somebody told me that you were passing through Singapore recently. Yes. Turned on the radio and there you were. Yes, something I did something like about 15 years ago and I thought, oh my God, and not another penny do I get. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? What was the serial? I can't remember, but I suddenly, I mean, I was just doing something in, in, in a room and I thought, mm. that's my voice. <laughs> <laughs> How dare they, you see? <laughs> Oh, See, yeah. people, you used to turn out those serials, didn't you? Just, uh, how, how many a day did you record? Well, it was the craziest life. You see, um, during the war, they weren't allowed to import shows. Mm -hmm. So they had to build uh, an industry, a radio industry, uh, here in Australia. Mm -hmm. There was a lot done in Melbourne, but I suppose even more done in Sydney. Mm -hmm. there, there, were, there were many studios and stations that, uh, that made serials. They used to type them out. And um, <clears throat> they'd come hot off the typewriter. I mean, you, uh, a quarter-hour serial, you'd probably have somebody would sneak in the door and give you your last two pages while you were still... Still you know, wet. Still, yeah, still yeah. wet, still doing it. I'd heard that, but then that's why experienced radio actors and actresses were so much in demand, because people who could literally just take a page of type that they'd never seen yeah. before and present it straight, because there was no, there were um, no rehearsals half the time. They were it? hectic Bang. days. We used to... Uh, we used to do um, a 12 and a half minute episode in, in three quarters of an hour. That would give you time quickly to read through, mark your script, you'd have a read and then, uh, and then cut it. And you'd do, pro pro probably you'd do uh, six of those in the morning, uh, you'd dash off and get a sandwich and a beer, and down to the next studio and you'd do three there, and then you'd have to run to 2GB and do three there, and then you'd do the Caltex Theatre reading in the, at half past five in the afternoon, you'd do that on Sunday. It was a frantic life, I can Absolutely tell you. incredible. <laughs> Were you ever involved with live radio drama? Yes. When I first started, the very first uh, radio show I ever did, I was 16, and it's rather an amusing story, really, because um, I'd had an audition. Um, I was a music student at the time at the Conservatorium. And I had an audition with the ABC. I wanted to be an actress. And um, somehow or other, <coughs> the, the audition papers got muddled up. And I was called to play the part. I'd passed the audition, obviously. 
I was paid to, uh, asked to play the part of a 75-year-old woman in hysterics <laughs> with a house being burnt down. Now, in the, in the cast were all the heavies. Um, there was Neva Carglin, there was John Tate, there was yeah. Peter Finch, there was Grant Taylor, and I went in for this first reading, 16-year-old kid, you can imagine. I thought, I can't do it, I can't do it. But I had a boyfriend who said, you can do anything. Right. So I listened to him and I thought, all right, I will. <laughs> it must have been awful. I, I, I did catch some of the looks, you know, between Peter Finch and Neva Cargo. It was a bit sort of, hmm, <laughs> like this. And it was my very first experience, and that was live. And we, in those days, we went in evening dress into the studio with no audience or anything, in evening Amazing. dress to do a play. Mm. And, um, Actually, you must have been so nervous with a cast like that that oh, you would have been close to hysterics anyway. All the stars, but, you know. Mm. But um, it must have been so awful. As a matter of fact, the, the producer of that particular show uh, came to be one of my very best friends, Paul O'Loughlin. He was a uh, producer at the ABC. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I didn't see him for years after. I think he, I think he went away, I think he was in, in, in the Air Force. Yes. And uh, years after, I was actually pregnant with my first child. I, I was at the Minerva Theatre being corseted in, you know, and, <laughs> and hiding the fact that I was about four or five months pregnant. Mm -hmm. And um, by the way, that show was with, uh, with uh, Ronnie Randall. Oh, really? Mm. Mm. And, uh, they invited me to come home and uh, uh, after the matinee and have dinner with them. And I thought, oh my God, I hope he doesn't remember that it was me oh. who did that who did terrible that 75 thing. 75-year-old woman he, in the Yes, he told me later that there was a terrible muddle up that it should have been the 75-year-old woman, you know. Mm. I, but you they got just the got muddled. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Now, it's funny, um, I sort of plucked Porsche faces life out of the air because I suppose that was one of the, one of the best, best known, known and yeah. longest running of the radio soap operas. But yeah. your name was one of those names at the end of every week they used to read the cast list, didn't they? They didn't they didn't yes. read it. Uh, some of them they did, some of them they didn't. But your name was one of those names that was just firmly embedded in my mind. Even if you didn't listen to the cast list, there were you know, yes. there were a couple of dozen people who did all those things, and, and your name right. was it one was, of those names. Yes, well, it was, a, it was a fairly closed shop because, as you can understand, it was such a, such a specialised thing. I suppose, um, well, we know that, you know, we had uh, a radio industry that was probably better radioactive than anyone in the world because we, were just, we just mm. had to do it. I mean, you might play anything up to five or six characters in one day and half a dozen accents and you, right. just, you just had to be good. Well, Hector Crawford was saying the other night when he was on the show that the radio industry, radio drama, was at the stage where you were literally exporting drama, radio drama, to the whole of the world. Oh, yeah. Well, obviously, they're still playing And them. they're still kicking around it. In the Bahamas, in Canada, in Singapore, I know they are, in, in, in uh, South Africa, goodness knows where else they are, I suppose anywhere where they speak English. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, listen, we last saw you in Melbourne, I think, on stage in Charlie Girl, didn't we? Or have you done anything here since then? Yes. Um, yes, I was in Charlie Girl, and I absolutely adored that show, and I mm. adored the part I was playing. That was um, the part of Kay Connor, who was the red-headed American millionaires. Mm who was the, the girlfriend of, yeah. of uh, Anna Needle. Anna we mm. had a very happy time. It was a wonderful part. Mm. And, but I, I've since been down uh, with John McCallum, where I played opposite John McCallum in uh, his, a play which he wrote himself, as it's played today. Mm. That was at the Comedy Theatre, yes. Right. Margot Lee, ladies and gentlemen. And after this break... <laughs> after this break, we'll be back for you to meet two of the stars of Holiday on Ice. Did you look at that?